Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the midweek Bible study of the Center Reach Bible Church. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we welcome you here. Um, this is our uh, midweek study where we get deep into the Word of God. We get real serious about the Word of God. And um, it takes about an hour for the most part, so we pray that you would stick with us. We say hi to everyone on Facebook Live. YouTube Live, don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you're following this and uh, you see it later. Uh, but without any further ado, we're going to get right to the study, new series starting, so it's going to be very exciting. Okay, we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56, which reads, Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel. According to all that he promised, there hath not failed one word of all his good promises, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you for your wonderful, matchless, wonderful word, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would give the winds a mighty voice, Lord, and take this message to the four corners of the galaxies and beyond. And if not there, take it to the people listening at home. And if not there, take it into our hearts here. And if not there, take it into my heart, Lord. And break our hearts, Lord, that we may be reformed and remade in your image, Lord. Pierce our hearts with truth and just let this go where it needs to go. Let thy Holy Spirit have complete reign over this, correct my errors, uh, bring out your truths. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this new series, I got a strange uh, title for you. You know how I like strange titles. The title is the WGMP of God, part one. So it's a W period, G period, M period, P period. And we're just going to do that once because from this point on, I'm going to tell you what it stands for, okay? It stands for the wonderful, glorious, manifold promises of God. The wonderful, glorious, manifold promises of God. But this is specifically for his bride, the church. It's going to be 30 promises that I, and I, I looked for 30 unusual promises that we don't usually, you know, grab onto and go, that's really great. So... I mean, there's a lot more than 30 promises, but we're going to go over 30, not tonight. Uh, we'll see how far we get. And then I have a special bonus promise, number 31, at the end of the series, which is really a very interesting promise that God has for us. But anyway, this new series, which on, this, on the surface seems to be a pretty simple undertaking, People have taught on the promises of God many times. Doesn't seem like it's a hard study to do. But that's the problem, is we take this study of the promises of God too lightly, and we don't teach it as serious and as truthful as we should, and we tend to do it flippantly, and we miss many, many things. We actually end up perverting, perverting and confusing people. They have all the studies that have been taught on the promises of God. Many of us have left confused because we were taught a promise. It didn't happen to us. And we say, hey, what's up, God? Pastor Bob, Jim, Joe, whatever said, this is a promise to me. And I trusted it. It didn't happen. And who do we blame? Pastor Jim, Bo, Bob, Uba, whatever, no. We blame God for a promise he didn't make to us. Which is why the wonderful, glorious, manifold promises of God that I'm going to teach over the next couple of weeks is going to be only specifically for the church. Christians, Bible-believing Christians who are saved by grace, Children of God do faith in the work of Christ's work on the cross. Now, you might wonder why I say that, and why am I specifically pointing out the promises to the church? Well, because this is the problem. 
Not every single promise in this Bible is for the church. And that's the problem. And we need to really rein this in and stop this insane perversion of applying everything that God says in every scripture to me. Okay? Because not everything in every scripture here is about you or about me. And we've got to be careful. And many pastors and teachers tend to do that, and they make it that the whole Bible is about you. And all God cares about is just you getting what you want. But that's not always the case. Okay? You know what God cares about? Getting what He wants. You know what He wants? Us. He wants our love. He wants our devotion. And He wants us to be with Him and to accept His payment for our sins. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about promises before we get to any of them. If we look up the word promise in uh, the dictionary, it's an oral or written agreement to do or not do something. But there's also something else, and people really need to understand this, especially in the Bible. There are two types of promises that God makes. Anybody know what they are? Conditional and unconditional. They're not the same. What's an unconditional promise? Meaning, meaning what? An unconditional promise means you get what the promiser has promised you regardless of what you do or don't do. If he promised it, it's coming not based on any merit of our own. Like salvation. God promises us salvation not based on any merit of our own. It's a promise to those who trust him. Now, what would be an example of that in our physical world? Okay, well, that would be like you buy something and they say, okay, uh, we're going to give you an unconditional guarantee that no matter what you do to this product, we're going to back it up. Now, you don't really see that unconditional guarantee too much because who wants to keep that guarantee? But what we do see a lot of is a conditional promise, which is you only get this promise if you follow the conditions of the one who made the promise. Example, okay, it's why you always, you know what, these things always in the small print, if you buy a new car, I know a lot about cars that's in, in engines and stuff. That's what I've done a good part of my life. If you buy a new car and your engine blows, okay, they have a warranty. They will give you a new engine if you change your oil properly. You use the right type of oil. You use the right type of oil filter. My father uh, was in the automotive business for many years and he worked at many dealerships and I remember he worked out at Pastor Chevrolet out, out east and I remember him telling me this guy, you know, engine blew on, on a new car, you know the first thing they do? Take an oil sample, okay? Because you better have the oil that they told you in that manual in that engine because they're looking for a loophole to get out of buying you a new engine. So it's very important. That's a conditional promise. We will give you this if you do that. Okay? Example. And in case you didn't know it, I am an oil filter nut. Okay? Oil and filter. I, I actually taught a class many years ago. My former trade or, uh, was called uh, fuels and lubrication where I taught like a whole semester college class on lubrication. I know a lot about lubrication, transmissions, hydraulic fluids, oils, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Freddie, can you lower the AC a little bit? It's getting a little warm. Or maybe Andrew can do that, drop it down a little bit. I see people going like this all over the place. That means we're hot. That means you're hot, OK? <laughs> That's what I knew. I thought it was some moving of the spirit or something. <laughs> Well, that's what I meant. I never get that right. But I want to lower it. I want it to get colder. I want it to get colder in here. Okay. Case in point, 
because I'm like one of those people, I research everything. If I'm buying anything, I'll spend six months before I buy a paperclip. What's the best paperclip? You know, I want to see studies. How many times could it bend? So I was looking at some oil filters and I was looking at a mobile one oil filter and I was watching the wall. I mean, you, once you click on these things, gosh, I've been watching things on filters for the last two days now because I just get crazy with this stuff. But mobile one that makes mobile one synthetic oil, which is a really good oil. It's not what I use. I use something better than that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I use Pennzoil Ultra Synthetic. Okay. Pennzoil Ultra Synthetic. It's almost as good. Amsoil is the best oil. Okay. But it's very expensive. Amsoil really is the best synthetic oil. But you can't buy it anywhere. It's very expensive. I did use it for a while. It's too much money. Pennzoil Ultra Synthetic. Uh, which you can't buy in the store, you got to get it online, but that's what I use, but it's the really, I don't know, why am I talking about this for? I don't know. I'm getting back into my oil and lubrication classes. I used to do this thing in, in, in the class where I'd have all these open jars of gear oil, uh, hydraulic fluid, brake fluid, and I told them if you're going to be a good mechanic, you should be able to smell by smell. You should be able to know what each, and one thing was just, Water, one thing was battery acid, looks just like water, okay? You should be able to smell, you should be able to know your oils. Anyway, getting back to the Mobile One filter, I was reading it and it says they have a new filter, it's good for 25,000 mile oil changes. I'm like, 25,000 miles on one oil change, so you watch it and that's their selling point, but, and that's their promise. But when you look at the fine print and you track it down, there's this little asterisk thing you got to hit and it opens up this thing. We will guarantee that this filter is good for your car for 25,000 miles oil change before you change your oil. But we recommend you follow the owner's manufactured oil change recommendations. So what's the point? Well, what's your promise then? You're not going to back it up, but you are going to back it up. And that's why who the person is who makes the promise is very important. You know, if you meet some guy on the street and says, hey, my name is Bob, and I'm going to make you this promise. And how much faith are you going to put in that promise? I promise next week I'm going to come here and do this. Well, I don't even know who you are. You want to know that the one who makes the promise is a worthy promise keeper. Okay? So that's what the word promise means. Now, getting back to these things is the biggest mistake we make in the church, especially through pastors and Bible teachers. If you guys have been around for the last you know, month and a half, I did a whole series on mistakes that I've made and why I was wrong about things. And, and then when God speaks to you, you got to clarify it. I had to apologize, repent about things that I wanted to make sure I got out there. But in regards to promises, this is the promise, this is the problem of all these promises. You know, Pastor so-and-so says, come to this church, my church, you give this money, and I promise you that God's going to promise you A, B, C, D, and E, and F, whatever. People take that seriously because you should trust, well, you really shouldn't trust what anybody tells you unless you can back it up with the book. Back it up with the book. Matter of fact, what happens when you have a warranty issue with your vehicle, with anything? What do you want to have, that warranty? You want to show them, hey, because if you go to a court of law, this is what you wrote. This is the warranty. You promised to take care of my issue. This is our warranty, our guarantee. But we have to use it wisely. We have to know what the guarantee is and to whom it is delivered to. And getting back to the point, pastors and Bible teachers, all of us, we make casualties of many believers because we tell them to trust in something that maybe isn't a promise to them. And sadly, always, always what happens when someone gives their, you know, their following God, they're trusting God, then there's a pastor who's telling them what to do. When the person who told them this is what God said fails them, 
they never blame the person. They blame God. And that's a problem. And that's why it's important that we know the promises. And I shared a couple of weeks ago a big promise that was going around that everybody was selling at every church during when COVID first came out was Psalm 91. That all you have to do, don't worry about COVID, just trust in the promises of Psalm 91 that no plague will come nigh your dwelling, impossible for you to get sick. And everybody was claiming that. I wasn't because that promise isn't for COVID. Okay? You have to know what it's talking about. I'm claiming Psalm 91. Well, if that was a promise, we've got two problems. Either God is a liar or we're misinterpreting the promise. Because if God promised that we claim this promise of Psalm 91, then why did any Christian ever get sick from COVID? It should have been an immunity to anything. So something's wrong. That's the problem. So the point is, you cannot apply all the... Pro and I tell you, I haven't heard too many people really talk on this. I don't know why, but they need to. You cannot apply all the promises in the Bible, be they conditional or unconditional, to everyone. Why? A, some promises are just for Israel. B, some promises are for the enemies of Israel. Does God make promises to his enemies? Yeah. Some promises are for the church, Christians, from the day of Pentecost up until the rapture. Okay? Applies to us. Some promises are only for the apostles. Boy, a lot of bad teaching comes around because we apply some of the promises that Jesus made to the apostles that they apply to Christians as the church. Okay? It's a slippery slope. Be very careful. Some promises are for the future time. There are some promises God has made that we haven't seen manifested yet. They will be soon. Okay? But they're coming in the future. So you can't take that promise and say, this is promise, this is for me today. No, God's speaking about something way in the future. It has nothing to do with you. Some promises were only for people in the past. Some promises in the Bible were for one particular person in a certain situation. It has nothing to do with anything else. And there are, there are some promises, which is interesting, that are for everyone. God has promises that are for the whole world, believer or unbeliever. And I'm going to give you an example. Now, I'm going to give you two examples as we build up this introduction to this study. And I'm going to read a real lengthy portion of Scripture. And you might say, why is he teaching all of this when we really want to know about the promises of God? Well, because I have... Uh, another agenda. I don't want to waste too much time. People, everything that I believe we should be teaching in these days should always be flavored with a little bit of eschatology, a little bit of what's going on in our world. So I'm going to, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone here. Check out this promise. Let's go to Genesis chapter 9, verse 8. This is an interesting promise that it applies to everyone who has ever existed from this point forward. Believer, unbeliever, Jew, Gentile, no matter who you are. Even creation itself. In the book of Genesis, which means the origin of things, chapter 9, verse 8. And we're going to read to verse 16. And God spoke unto Noah and his sons with him, saying... And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you. A covenant is a promise, a legal binding promise. And with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you. Wow, this is a promise also to animals too? To oceans, to trees, to birds, everything? Of the fowls, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you. 
from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. That's a promise. And God said, this is the token. Now, this is amazing. God says, besides making the promise, I'm going to give you a manifested physical token. Do you know when we get, when we have a, wedding ceremony. The wedding band is called a token. When I perform a wedding, I say, what token do you have to symbolize this unity? And it's usually something precious, you know, and I go into this whole thing, it's, you know, made of a precious metal, it has no beginning, no end, and all that stuff. Well, God, in this particular promise, why did he go to such extremes? Because it's an important one. God says, I'm not going to just make the promise. I'm going to give you a reminder of the promise all the time when what I use to do what I am going to tell you that I'm going to do happens. You will be reminded that it won't happen in such a way ever again. Let's read on. Verse 12, and God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations, forever, every dispensation of time. I do set my bow, okay? Whose bow? God's bow. What bow? Rainbow. Rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. You know, God called, he wants his rainbow back. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and all, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Now, isn't it interesting? You know, so many things happen in in our life and in the world that we just take them for granted. Like when we look up at night, we see the moon. There's this big round thing just hanging there. It's incredible. And there's the sun, and there's these stars, and... After it rains, a rainbow appears, right? And it's, is it some chaotic thing? No, it's an orderly array of all the spectrums of the colors, neatly put in lines. It's incredible. And it happens after it rains. And we say, oh, I, I saw somebody, uh, somebody made a comment about God's rainbow, and somebody said, oh, it's just an alignment of water, of water crystals and, and just uh, in, in, in fractions of sun rays, and it forms this thing. Yeah, give me a break. Give me a break. That's a promise unconditional. God promises, I will never, ever, ever, destroy the earth with water like I did. But I never said anything about fire. (laughs) Example, let's go to Revelation chapter 18, verse 11, which is another promise, not for the church, because the church of Jesus Christ won't be here when this promise is fulfilled. And always remember when I say the church, God is not talking about this building. The building is not a church. This is just sheetrock, in case you don't know it, with lumber and two-by-fours. That's all it is. It's not a holy place. It's only holy when the church is in it, when the people are in it. If we all got up, like we do on Sunday, we meet outside, and we meet outside, that's where the church meets. This is just a, a place where we assemble. The church is the bride of Christ which that which he came to save and he is the groom and he loves his bride but let's look at a a promise of the future okay going to read a little bit of scripture because this is pretty interesting i think it'll make you think about today okay revelation 18 verses 1 through 11 
And I know this is going to raise up a lot of questions. What's he talking about? What does that mean? Oh, for another study. And if you want to know what this means, you could listen on my YouTube. Uh, you can go to my whole study I did on the book of Revelation, verse by verse by verse, to find out what this means. Revelation 18.1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven. Now, this is the future. The church has been removed in the rapture. We're talking about during the tribulational time. And I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the inhabitation of demons and the hold of every foul spirit and, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies." And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her according to her works. In the cup which she has filled, fill to her double." How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and I have no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in, her, in therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord who judges her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, the mighty city, in one hour thy judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. Wow. Wonder who or what city is destroyed in one hour. Okay? And everyone is in awe because all their money that they use to buy and make off of this place. Interesting, isn't it? Okay? Plagues and famines. That's a future thing. But we're not talking about that tonight. I think you get the point. And the point that I want to make tonight is, why are so many people confused? It's because they're confused when they claim a promise to something else that doesn't belong to us. Because we can say, well, that could, you know, this promise is, this is for us today. No, this is not for us today. This will not happen while the church is here. Some people will debate that. But let's go to, uh, for an example, of some promises that can be for everyone, even though they're for one person in particular, but can you take those promises that appear to be for everyone and apply them to us? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Let's go with what we started with, 1 Kings 8.56. And I just want to, because I, I don't want people to say, you know what, how about all the promises in the Old Testament and the Psalms? We can't apply any of those. I'm not saying we can't apply those. But you just got to make sure you're applying the right ones. So 1 Kings 8, 56 and 57. Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people, Israel, according to all that he promised, there has not failed one word of his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. The Lord, our God, be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us. 
Now, this is a promise that God is going to give rest to His people, Israel. Well, can I apply that to the church? Well, I'd have to ask, does God give rest to those who are His children? Yes. If you're a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, does God promise rest? Well, I can't base it solely on 1 Kings 8.56, but I can get a flavor of the character of God. What's the character of God? We know that He takes care of His own, He takes care of His children, He is a comforter, He is a guide. So we can safely say that, hmm, so God made a promise of rest for Israel. Will He make a promise of rest for the church? Well, to back up that point, we should have some scriptures in the New Testament that say that. And then we could all say, Amen. Okay, well, let's go to Hebrews 4, 7. Hebrews 4, 7, which is in the New Testament, verses 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And it's interesting how we see uh, the writer speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ the church time, but also referring back to the rest of Israel. Hebrews 4, 7, Again he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is, said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. We can all apply that. If you're a person of God through faith in Jesus Christ, there is a rest. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So we can see we can apply things Many of the, you know, the Psalms have tons of promises. Many of them we can apply to us today. If they're, if they're generic and they're speaking about God's people, but we have to be careful. We just don't pull everyone that's like, you know, like a, you know, a very specific thing. Uh, like I shared with you guys, this, you know, the scripture that everyone God's, you know, that everyone uses a lot. Have I not promised you to give you favor and all that stuff and uh, I have a plan and what's that scripture? Jeremiah 29 11. Uh, a plan for you to prosper and to be well. Well yeah we could apply that because that's what a good father does but that's not talking about the church. It's speaking about a, a specific specific a specific <laughs> situation in a certain time when God was dealing with Israel and a particular person. Okay, so we have to be careful. But let's get to, well, I don't want to get to that yet. We're going to talk from this point on and for the rest of the weeks to follow. We're just going, and I, and I think this is unique because I, I specifically just am looking for promises, number one, only in the New Testament, Number two, only those that were made in the epistles to the church, to Christians. Meaning, we're going to omit the promises that were made to the apostles. Now, that's a very slippery slope. And every time I bring this up, people are always like, I never heard anybody say that, Pastor. Well, because when Christ was speaking to the apostles and promising them certain things, was everything he promised the apostles, all the supernatural things, do they apply to us too? Okay? Now, there is a church, and I do this in parentheses, which is why this is dangerous, in Redding, California. Okay? Bethel Church. It is one of the worst perverted, and I don't care to say it online, perversions of anything that's, that that calls themselves Christian. And what do they do there? Okay, well, first of all, they're a word of faith. They're a new apostolic reformation church. They're way out there. But they only read the Gospels. 
only the words of Jesus Christ. They don't read anything else. Only what Jesus said to the apostles, only what Jesus said is what they use. They really don't want nothing to do with the Old Testament or the epistles. And their, their argument is, well, what's wrong with that? We're just using the words of Jesus. It should be the best. Well, then why do we have the rest of the Bible then for? Okay, you've got to be careful with these things. You've got to rightly divide the word of God, being very careful. Because I believe that not everything that Jesus said and promised to the 12 apostles are for us. Some of them are. Okay, some of them are, but not everyone. So we're going to admit, for this sake, anything that Jesus said to the apostles. Okay, so we're going to focus first on what Jesus, God in the flesh, the promises he made to his bride. Now, this is, in case you never heard that term, I want to say it again. Jesus or God calls the church his bride. The groom is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the groom who is waiting for his bride. You might not realize this, but the wedding ceremony that we all know and love, the bride with the white dress going up to the altar to meet the groom, where does that come from? Bible. It's all a picture of salvation. And what it, it used to be, the bride can't wear white unless she's a virgin, right? Where did that come from? That's scriptural. That the sins of the bride are washed away with the blood of the Lamb, right? That she is worthy to wear white. When we come to Christ, all of our past sins have been washed away. We can wear white. It's a, a funny little thing. It's not funny. You know, many times I've married a lot of people over the years, a lot of young couples. And, and, I, and I have to give credit. You know, there are a lot of young Christian couples. And a lot of, well, I would say 98%. And sadly... Very few people have ever remained pure for the wedding night. It's, it's almost non-existence. I think in all of these years, I've known two couples, two couples who waited, okay? And one of the people are here tonight. <laughs> and it's not me. <laughs> it's not me. But I remember, you know, the young girls will go, you know, Pastor, I just feel, you know... I'm not pure for my husband, and can I wear white? I say, absolutely. You know why? You know why? I said, are you, are you a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ? Yes. Then everything you've done in your past has been forgiven. You are a virgin in Christ because of what Christ has done. You are able to wear white because he doesn't look upon our past. And I do tell them, I said, if you want to do, if you really are serious about this, well, from this day forward until the wedding, do not be together. And usually the guy goes, well, I don't know if I like that. <laughs> because, because I tell them, you know what, when you get married, the honeymoon is going to be just another day. It's going to be like, well, we've done this a hundred times. There'll be nothing special. So if you just... Confess what you did in the past and do this in honor of God. I tell you, he will bless you. will bless you. That's a little side note anyway. But that's why God, he calls us to bride and he's coming back for his bride. And there's going to be a reception in heaven. They call it the marriage feast. Okay? That's an exciting thing. One day, uh, we'll have to show that movie again called uh, Before the Wrath. We showed it here. Great, it, it shows that the whole plan of God, the church, the bride, salvation, the rapture of the church, it's all found in the wedding ceremony of the early people in that place and time. It's an amazing study that, that has recently come up. But anyway, these are the promises 
to those of you who are here or are listening online who are children of God, Christians, through faith in Jesus Christ on His work, not on your good deeds, not because you helped 30 old ladies across the street, or you gave money to the poor, or you did some good deed, or you didn't eat chocolate for a month, or whatever it is, but because you trust that you are a sinner. You need to be forgiven. Christ went to the cross, took the curse of sin that belonged on us, took it on Himself, died with our sins, rose again, defeating death, paying for what we deserve. And if you trust that and you believe that, then you're a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's really easy for us and hard for God. He does all the work. We just have to accept the gift. So if that's who you are and you have, you have come to that, you say, yes, I am a Christian. I believe that, that without Christ I am nothing. It is only through His work on the cross that I am forgiven and my sins have washed clean. It's His righteousness, not mine. So, these are the promises. Promises, Promise number one, okay? God's promise of provision. Now, this is going to play an important role, people. What do we got? People are really concerned, okay? And, and I, shared, uh, well, I, I shared during prayer time. Just today, I was out actually looking at oil filters, uh, and, I, and I always listen to everyone's conversation. I'm very nosy, and if I hear people talking about stuff about God or world events, I always listen, and if I feel led, I'll like jump in and say something. So I heard these two people on the other aisle talking about, man, do you hear what's happening, man? We're not going to have food in, in the fall, the shortages, what are we going to do? I know, did you hear about this? People are talking about what's going to happen this fall. Is there going to be food? Are the shelves going to have? Or is there going to be fuel? Is there going to be a gas shortage? What if, what if gas is, you know, California just made $10 a gallon. $10 a gallon. Okay? We're, it's a record. It's never been that high before. It's getting very scary. Well, what a great promise to know that God will provide. God makes a promise to his bride, his church of provision. Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, we always read that scripture, we take it out of context, because if you read verse 18, it's actually a promise that Paul made to Ephrathitis because when Paul was in prison and he had needs, and even when he wasn't in prison, the church was sending him money and food and provision. And he says, as you have provided for me, I'm telling you, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Meaning what? God promises to supply our need through His supply. Not ours, His. Meaning, what does God promise? Food, shelter, and clothing. Okay, Those are the three things He promises. Do you know everything else is not a a need, it's a want. God promises to meet our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. I will give you bread for this day. You remember when God was dealing with Israel? Remember? What, what a cool lesson. Remember, every day God would drop manna down, bread, right? For this day. But what did the people do? I better gather some extra for tomorrow just in case God fails me. And what did God do to that bread? Made it go rotten. But the people thought, oh yeah, that guy's bread, I'm getting his bread, man, because we got nothing, we're in the wilderness. And God says, you gather extra for yourself? What does that mean? You don't trust me for tomorrow. Now, people, don't take this to mean that we shouldn't, you know, you could, if you want to stock up on stuff, be my guest. You probably should, okay? I'm not saying don't, you know, don't be foolish, Okay, you can, that's a wise. Those who don't plow by reason of cold are going to beg and harvest. That's what the Proverbs say. 
Okay? So be wise. But God was making the point, at the end of the day, who's going to provide for us? Him. What, how are you going to do it? That's what they were saying. And it's interesting, every day God provided bread would just fall out of the sky and land outside their tents. The best food. Can you imagine what manna tastes like? That was, you know what? What was put in the Ark of the Covenant? Piece of manna, right? Aaron, uh, Aaron's but, uh, staff that budded. Or, what was it? Moses' staff that budded. They put a piece of manna in there. Angel's food, they called it. But every day, God provided that bread. But every day, they wondered, would he provide the day after? And then what happened? Did they start complaining about the bread? Okay, another dose of bread. They murmured. Can you see us doing that? Okay. I, I just saw a clip. You know, you see these things and you go, Lord, society is in such a bad place. It was one of those TikTok things where it just happened, where it was in one of those Chuck E. Cheese places. Anybody see that? Did you see that? That these moms were fighting over something with their kids. It's one of those little kids' places you go to. They were punching each other to a madhouse in front of their kids, little kids, in this game place, the people were out of control. And you look at them, boy, people are ready to snap. Can you imagine if you can't get gas or you can't get fuel for heat? What will people do? Riot, Riot okay? You, and I'm not trying to scare you people. I'm, I'm, I'm just letting you know that's what people do. Remember, I mean, uh, when we had that, I think it was Hurricane Sandy, Remember, we didn't have uh, electricity for like two weeks or a week. I remember getting gas in the gas lines and yet people running out of gas. And what did they have to do with the gas station right here in Center Beach? Cops had to be there. What? You cut in front of me, I get my gas, I want that can. People are ready to punch you in the nose for five gallons of gas. Wow. So, isn't it great to be a child of God? God promises us people. And I, I tell you, the promises, we're, we're going to talk about some that are eternal, but most of them are promises while we live here on earth. And I picked out some beautiful ones, especially the promises that God gave to us to live in peace when everything is crazy. Because people are going to look, oh, aren't you guys concerned, man? No, I trust my God. He loves me. Well, how do you know? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you love your children? Of course I do. Do you make sure they eat before you do? Of course I do. Well, my father in heaven will take care of his children. I am his child, and he will make sure I have what I need. He will. Number two, a promise of God for the ability that he will give us to persevere through all types of troubles. Now, I'm using unusual promises because everybody gives, you know, every time it just drives me crazy, if you, if you go to a study on promises, what do they tell you? God promised you're going to be wealthy and happy and all these things. Well, how about these promises? Okay? Because God doesn't promise you you're going to be healthy and wealthy. He doesn't. But he does promise these things. A promise to persevere. People, I want that gift. What does it mean to persevere, to move ahead, go through some hard times, hunker down and say, you know what? God, keep me going. Don't you feel that all the time, right? I, every day I need the gift, the promise to persevere. God, keep me going another week. Keep me pushing through this week, through this test that you have to go through, through this situation with a person in your life. Help me. How do I keep going without getting discouraged with temptation and all these things? Philippians 4, 12 through 13. The Apostle Paul explains a little bit about how to persevere. He says in verse 12, I know both how to abase and I know how to abound. I've been rich, been poor, had a lot, have little. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound 
and to suffer need. Verse 13. Now, this is interesting. We all know this. We have it up here. Okay? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. But you know what's interesting? You see what happens when you take a scripture out of context? When we read first, I mean, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Well, can I fly? Can I walk through walls? I guess if God wanted me to, I could. But is that what God is saying? Is that what Paul is saying? Not really. He's saying, he's talking back about verse 12. He goes, I know how to get through these things. I know because I've been and God has gotten me through. And my conclusion is, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I can get through hard times. I can go through times when there's not that much food because God is with me. See how you got to be careful. And I have to be, I have to say, I have misused this scripture until I really thought about it. Because is God really saying, I can do all things? No, I can do the things that he spoke about. And if we go back up to verse 11, 10, 9, that's what he's talking about. He doesn't mean that I can fly. Well, God says I can do all things. I'm going to jump off this building tonight. And, God, and, and there's some nut someplace who will do it. And say, God said, I can do all things. Well, he's not talking about, well, well can you be God? Right? You've got to be careful. Scriptural interpretation, very important. Number three, promise number three. And now, we don't think upon this. We should. And if you were here for my last five weeks here, we spoke about this a lot. Number three, a promise to never feel God's wrath on us. Isn't that a great thing? I will, and you in Christ, God's wrath, will never be on you. He will never beat you up. You will never have to see. Remember what we read in Revelation 18? That ain't going to hit you. And I, and I argue with people. I tell you, I have, this, I have some dear friends, you know, and lately it's been just a, a big discussion. Is the church going to go through the tribulation? And sometimes I lose my patience because, you know, Pastor, I, I, I think we're going to go through the tribulation. I, and I tell them, I say, listen, if the church is going to go through that future tribulation, then the God of the Bible is a liar. And the whole gospel makes no sense. And you might as well throw it. What do you mean? I said, if Jesus Christ is the groom and we are his bride, and, and I ask, if you were a groom and you loved your bride and you saw somebody coming up and punching her in the face, would you sit by would you not rescue her if you had the power? Yeah. Does God have the power? Yeah. He's not going to let his... Besides, the tribulation has nothing to do with the church. It's all about Israel. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Nothing to do with us. Okay. Remember at Sodom, what did God do before he destroyed it? He removed his people. Right? It's like a little rapture. What did God do at the flood? He removed his people. So the wrath of God didn't fall on them. And anyone could have got on that boat. When Sodom was going to get judged for their perversion, which do you know our world today, especially our nation, makes Sodom and Gomorrah look like not so bad. I just said it today. Okay? It really is. And God, why did he destroy Sodom? Sexual perversion to the 10th degree. And you know what? Anyone could have left with Lot and his family. But they loved it. Even his wife. Right? Interesting thing. And it says a lot. Remember God said, you know, Lot, get your wife, get your kids, get out of there. And don't look back. back. And why would God say that? Because we all love a little bit of our sin. And you think his wife, you know, she's probably saying, Honey, we grew up here. We raised our kids here. I got neighbors. I got friends. I kind of like it a little bit. Yeah, so it's a little bit perverted and nasty. God says, don't look back because that's where your heart is then. 
And she paid the price. And that's a warning to God. Don't ever look back at our old life and go, yeah, I'm glad I'm a Christian, but but I had some good parties back there. Well, you should have seen me back then, man. I was rocking. Sometimes we do that, and God says, don't do that. Don't glorify your past life, because I think maybe you missed that past life. I think you think that past life is better than this new life. And sometimes we do that. It's a danger. So a promise never to feel God's wrath, meaning nothing to fear when we die, especially. Romans 5, 8, and 9. We're going to end with this one here. We've got a whole bunch more promises to come next week. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. But God commended His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than now being justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. Even before we came to Christ, Christ already paid for our sins and waiting for us to accept that. And the wrath that should have been on us, went on His own Son. The wrath of God went on Christ instead of where it needed to go on me. He gave us a gift. And if God would do that for us for salvation, would He not do that during the tribulation? So I, cause I, I don't want to go on a whole study here, but there are, there are three schools of thoughts of what's coming next in Bible prophecy. Okay, and, you know, tribulation, well, rapture, tribulation, millennial reign of Christ. And, there, and that seven years of tribulation, which is a future event, which Jesus, it's clearly defined as seven years in the future. There are some people believe that we are going to be around for that. Some people that believe that halfway through mid-tribulationists, that we're going to have to go halfway, three and a half years into it. Some are post tribulationists believe that the church is going to be raptured and the second coming of Christ are the same thing. No. In the rapture, we leave with Christ. In the second coming, we come back with Christ. It's pretty cool. Okay? And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So how can we go through such a time as that? Now, it doesn't mean we won't see hard times on planet Earth. Okay? Yeah, World War II, look at the people in the concentration camps. Now, those are pretty, that's pretty hard times, okay? Pretty hard times. So we can't say, well, we'll never see anything like, you know, like what's going on in Romania or nothing like that. Or, no, well, we could. We could see the fall of our nation. We could see it crumble. We could see turmoil and chaos. We, we've been spared. We live in a little bubble fantasy that <laughs> never happened to us over here. Could. But that doesn't mean, because I this, this uh, another fellow that I talked to is always telling me, no, I think we're in the tribulation now. This is it. I said, my friend, you're sitting by your pool with your feet up on your lounge chair. You're not in the tribulation. You're watching it on your laptop. No, but this is really bad. No, it's not the tribulation. What did Jesus say? It'll be such a time that has never been, nor will there ever be again. You don't want to be here. We're talking meteors and fire from the sky and crazy beast creatures and, and famine and fire and, and plagues and sickness and people running chaotic in the streets. Like when you see, like when we had all those riots and stuff, it'll be everywhere. It'll be horrible. You will be hiding. The Bible says people will be hiding under the rocks to stay alive. Church will not be there for that. That's a prom- That's actually another promise for the church. Okay. Anyway, we're going to get to these promises next week. We're going to close in a word of prayer. Okay. Father in heaven, Lord, I've never appreciated so much what it is to be a Christian, Lord. So thankful. I'm thankful for my salvation. I'm thankful, Lord, because I know I don't deserve anything but you give me everything more than I could ever imagine. I am thankful that my sins have been forgiven, even the sins I'm going to do tomorrow, maybe even tonight. 
They are already paid for under the blood of Christ. And yet you love me like a father. I've been adopted into your family. And as we'll see in the weeks to come, we have the security that nothing can take us out of that. Wow, the world, I see these people today, they have no idea how desperately they need Jesus Christ. Because we can sit back and not maybe not laugh, but we can sit back and know my Father will take care of me. As a child, Lord, I, I think you taught us all those things growing up. I remember as a little boy when there was lightning storms and hurricanes. When I was a little boy, I never worried about my father got laid off or there was no money for, for Christmas presents or when who was ever sick. I never knew any of that because I just, my dad takes care of that stuff. I just play with my toys. And that's a picture. That's why you say when you come to Christ, come as a child, trusting in his father. And when we come to Christ, you go from creator God to father God. You become our father, a loving father. A father that will smack us in the rear when we need to be smacked, but also a father who provides so his children do not have to be concerned. The only thing the child has to be concerned of is that they are obedient to mom and dad. That's the only, that's the only uh, job a child really has is to obey. Children, obey your mother and father, for this is right in the Lord. And that's our job. Obey you, Lord. After we come to Christ, obey you best we can. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for your promises. They are so wonderful. And we can truly enjoy this beautiful day that you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys.